so with consideration now let's uh, refer to the AMA guide well we also have motor or efferent fiber and so we have all these fibers coming and going from the spinal cord and so if you picture uh, in your mind a cross section of the spinal cord and you've seen those cross section diagrams before and if you picture a cross section of say the mid thoracic spinal cord we have fibers coming in on the sensory side which are bringing sensory information from receptors mostly in the skin but also from in receptors in the muscles uh, receptors in the tendons receptors in the joint structures even receptors in the bone uh, in the bone receptors are found uh, in the bone marrow and also in the periosteum of bone and so all these receptors are conveying information up into the spinal cord and all of these sensory fibers have their nerve cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion in this example in the thoracic spine lies very close uh, to the spinal cord. We're going to see later on in this program that in the lumbar spine uh, the dorsal root ganglion is many inches away from the spinal cord because we have the cauda equina and we'll talk about the cauda equina here shortly. So anyway, uh, information comes in from the periphery through these peripheral processes. Uh, information travels up into the dorsal root ganglion and then from the dorsal root ganglion by way of central processes the information then uh, gets into the spinal cord which as we said earlier is the integration and control center. Uh, from the spinal cord information can go in any one of several different directions. Uh, in our example here uh, information uh, sensory information uh, gets processed through the spinal cord and then motor information or motor commands are sent out anterior horn cells which are conveyed in the ventral root uh, of the spinal cord and then the dorsal root and the ventral root then coalesce or fuse and are wrapped in uh, conjoined perineurium and once we uh, then see these roots uh, combined or joined we now have two-way traffic uh, in the spinal nerve. We have sensory information coming up the spinal nerve and we have motor information or commands uh, going down the spinal nerve and with regards to the motor commands uh, alpha motor neurons send uh, commands to skeletal muscle uh, tissue and autonomic uh, motor efferents which have their cell bodies not in the anterior uh, horn but in the intermedial lateral horn of the spinal cord uh, they send their information out motor information commands out to cardiac muscle smooth muscle and glands and then remember that at least with regards to the sympathetic nervous system very near uh, to the uh, spinal nerve root traveling alongside the spinal nerve roots we have the sympathetic ganglia that run up and down uh, the spinal cord extending from the cervical region all the way down into uh, the sacral region and it's those uh, sympathetics are going to become important uh, when we get into our discussion of uh, peripheral nerve entrapment specifically of the lower extremity. So this pattern continues up and down the spine with uh, sensory information coming in and motor information going out uh, and information traveling in two directions in the spinal nerve roots and then the spinal nerve roots uh, then combine and give us uh, the various plexuses uh, up and down the spine. Uh, in other programs uh, we talk about the cervical and brachial plexuses. In this program uh, we're going to talk about the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus as those are the two plexuses uh, that are involved in uh, the lower extremities. 
So the spinal nerve roots uh, coalesce into the named peripheral nerves of the lower extremities through either uh, the lumbar plexus, which is formed from the nerve roots of L1, L2, L3, and L4, or uh, through the sacral plexus, which is formed from the nerve roots of L4, L5, S1, S2, uh, and S3. And all of these nerve roots uh, are mixed, are mixed in that uh, they carry all three uh, of the types of fibers that are described in the AMA guides, of which there's actually four. Uh, there are somatic, sensory, and motor fibers, and there are autonomic uh, sensory and motor fibers, and the autonomic fibers carry impulses, as we said, to smooth muscles in arterial walls, uh, sweat glands, uh, and also to erector pili muscles. And also, uh, we said that autonomic fibers carry impulses to cardiac muscle. Well, of course, cardiac muscle is not of concern to us in this program about the lower extremities. So when we think about the autonomic fibers uh, that are innervating structures of the lower extremities, those autonomic fibers uh, are innervating somatic structures. Somatic, what are the autonomic somatic structures? Well, in the lower extremity, we don't have viscera. We do have autonomic somatic structures, however, and those include uh, sweat glands. And you know that there's a lot of sweat glands in the lower extremity. There's sweat glands on the feet, and there's sweat glands on the surface of the, that empty on the surface of the skin. There are also uh, erector pili muscles. And uh, those erector pili muscles are somatic structures under autonomic control. Also, uh, the blood vessels, the, the arteries and arterioles, uh, are uh, lined with smooth muscle in the tunica media. And that smooth muscle, uh, uh, those arteries uh, bring blood to somatic structures, such as the muscles of the leg. And those arteries uh, are under autonomic control. So we have all four types of fibers uh, in these spinal nerve roots. And so these spinal nerve roots are then going to go into the lower extremity uh, through either the lumbar plexus or the solar uh, sacral plexus. And they're going to give us the named uh, peripheral nerves uh, that we'll be talking uh, about when we get to a discussion of peripheral nerve lesions and or peripheral nerve entrapments. But before we even get to that, there is some unique anatomy uh, that takes place down in the lumbar and sacral region of the spinal cord. And recall that the lumbar and sacral region of the spinal cord is different from the lumbar or sacral region of the spine because as you know the spinal cord itself ends or terminates at around the L1 or 2 spinal segment level or spinal column level. So let's talk about the anatomy uh, of the lumbar and sacral spinal cord and how the anatomy of the spinal cord relates to the anatomy of the spinal column. And then finally, how those two anatomies uh, combine to give us uh, the lumbar and sacral plexuses, and then finally, the named peripheral nerves uh, of the lower extremities. Now, if you've ever read an MRI report uh, of a lumbar spine study, you've probably, you'll probably recall that the radiologist starts his MRI report uh, with a description of some normal findings, one of which is that they'll usually state that the spinal cord ends normally uh, at about the L1 to L2 region. And, and I can <coughs> personally admit that I've read that hundreds of times, and I can tell you that I never really gave it much thought. 
And so let's think a little bit about that right now. The MRI report says that the lumbar spine, the, uh, I'm sorry, the spinal cord ends normally at the L1 to 2 level, L1 to L2 spinal level. So the reason that the spinal cord ends at the L1 to L2 level is because <coughs> that the growth of the spinal column exceeds the growth of the spinal cord such that the spinal column grows much faster and much longer than does the spinal cord. So by the time that the spinal column is fully mature, it's much longer uh, than the spinal cord. And typically the spinal cord itself ends as what's called the conus medullaris, the terminal cone, uh, generally ends at about the spinal segmental level somewhere between uh, about L1 and L2. And if you could take the spinal cord out of the spinal column and look at just the spinal cord stripped of its rootlets and spinal nerve roots, you would see that the spinal cord uh, is um, a cylindrical structure that has two uh, enlargements uh, from cephalic to caudal. The first enlargement is called the cervical enlargement. And what the cervical enlargement is, is an enlargement of the spinal cord, uh, the purpose of which is to accommodate the many extra millions, probably millions of additional uh, neurons that then innervate the upper limbs. Well, similarly, uh, in the lumbar part of the spinal cord, there is uh, a similar enlargement called the lumbar enlargement. And the lumbar enlargement commences at about the level of T, T11, uh, reaches its maximum circumference of about 33 millimeters. That's about 1.3 inches. And, and, and even though that's not very large, that is the enlarged portion uh, of the spinal cord in the lumbar regions, about 1.3 inches in circumference. And it has its maximum circumference right at about L1, below which it tapers rapidly into the terminal cone or the conus medullaris. And this lumbar enlargement contains all the spinal nerve segments from L1 through S3. So this is actually quite fascinating. There is a tremendous compaction uh, <coughs> of neurons in this lumbar enlargement. So much so that this small segment of the spinal cord uh, contains all the neurons which innervate uh, all the entirety of the lower extremities all the way down to your tippy toe uh, and all structures uh, innervated uh, even as high up as the L1 nerve root. And we call this distal end of the spinal cord, uh, we call this the conus medullaris. And from the conus medullaris, all the spinal nerve roots then continue down the spinal column uh, as the cauda equina. Now the conus medullaris is the terminal end of the spinal cord. Uh, as we said, it occurs at around L1, sometimes as low as L2. And then the, the spinal nerves continue uh, dangling down through the spinal column uh, as the cauda equina. And each one of these nerves has to uh, traverse several inches in the spinal canal before it finally reaches uh, its exit foramen. So even though the L5 nerve root, for example, uh, exits the spinal column at the uh, below the L5 vertebra, it has its origin up in the spinal cord at around the L1 to L2 region up in the conus medullaris. So 
unlike the cervical spine nerve roots, the lumbar spine nerve roots can be damaged anywhere along uh, their intradural course from the spinal cord all the way down to the neuroforamen where they exit the spinal column. And most commonly, uh, these nerve roots are damaged uh, at the exit foramen by a disc lesion. Uh, but of course, we know they can be injured at other points uh, throughout their course down the spinal column. Those of you that have the handout notes or that have the PowerPoint presentation, uh, I want you to uh, review the diagram here of the conus medullaris and the cauda equina that continues off of the conus medullaris. And note uh, some interesting anatomy here that you may, uh, may not have given much thought to up till now. Note that the spinal nerve roots dangle down, and there are many of them. That's why it's called a horse's tail. And essentially, all spinal nerve roots that dangle down uh, are double in number because the dorsal and ventral roots dangle independently. The dorsal and ventral roots do not coalesce and are not joined in a common periner perineurium until immediately before uh, the exiting foramen. And interestingly, unlike uh, unlike uh, more superior spinal levels, say up in the thoracic and cervical spine where the dorsal root ganglion uh, resides uh, within the spinal canal um, at the local segmental level. Here in the lumbar spine, the dorsal root ganglion of the afferent fibers is located uh, within the spinal canal, but it's located at the spinal segmental level rather than at the spinal cord segmental level. So just to rephrase that another way, if we're considering uh, the L5 nerve roots, the L5 nerve roots come off of the conus medullaris and both the sensory root, the dorsal root, and the motor root, which is the ventral root, both of those dangle independently and the sensory root dangles down and just immediately prior to its exit from the neuroforamen or you might even say prior to its entrance or, or you might say immediately after its entrance into the neuroforamen that's where we find the dorsal root ganglion so in this case the dorsal root ganglion is located uh, many many inches away uh, from the spinal cord and then immediately prior to those nerve roots exiting the foramen, uh, they then join uh, into a single spinal nerve root, which then gives off the posterior primary ramus and an anterior primary ramus. And it's from the anterior primary ramus that we then get the uh, lumbar and sacral plexuses. Um, uh, Additionally, uh, recall that in the sacral spine, uh, the sacral spinal nerves uh, come off of the terminal cone at the conus medullaris. Like I said, there's a lot of activity, a uh, lot of nerve roots coming off this small section of the spinal cord. And the sacral nerves, S2, S3, and S4, uh, contain parasympathetic fibers. And let's just think about this a little bit. We said that at least in the thoracic spine, the sympathetic fibers, the autonomic efferent sympathetic fibers, have their cell bodies in the intermediolateral horn of the spinal cord. Not in the dorsal horn, not in the ventral horn, but it's in the intermediolateral horn. And, and, and those sympathetic fibers, uh, are found in the thoracic spine in the spinal cord level T1 through approximately L1, L2. The sympathetic system is known as the thoracolumbar output. Well, so then we have a period where uh, there's a section of the spinal 
chord from approximately L2 to approximately S2 where there are no uh, sympathetic fibers uh, arising out of this lateral horn of the spinal cord, but around uh, sacral spinal level, sacral spinal cord level, S2, S3, S4, uh, we see the reappearance of motor neurons emerging from an analogous area uh, of the spinal cord, an analogous lateral or intermediolateral horn area of the sacral spinal cord. And those uh, parasympathetic fibers, like the uh, sensory fibers of the dorsal root and the motor fibers of the ventral root, uh, these sympathetic fibers travel down in the same route as the motor fibers uh, contained within the uh, ventral root and ventral, yeah, ventral roots. So interesting, there's a lot of activity taking place uh, down at this lumbosacral spinal cord with sacral spinal nerve roots, the uh, anterior roots also containing uh, parasympathetic fibers uh, from sacral spinal cord levels S2, S3, and S4. And those of you that have the handout materials or that have the PowerPoint presentation uh, will notice that uh, we have a diagram here that shows uh, the conus medullaris and it shows the cauda equina draping down from the conus medullaris. And you'll notice that the lumbar spine nerve roots start draping off of the conus medullaris at about one to two inches prior uh, to its uh, termination at around the L1 or 2 level. So in all actuality, the lumbar spine nerve roots uh, of the cauda equina start at about the spinal level of T10 to T11. So that's an interesting anatomic uh, variation of the anatomy of the lumbar uh, spine lumbar spinal cord and lumbosacral uh, spinal nerve roots. And if that wasn't enough to consider, imagine that in addition to descending uh, lumbar, sac lumbar and sacral spinal nerve roots, uh, consider that all along the spinal cord, all along the spinal column, uh, we have the sympathetic chain ganglion. Now, we refer to the sympathetic uh, nervous system as being th of thoracolumbar output. Now, what that means is that the nerve cell bodies uh, of the sympathetic motor neurons have their cell bodies in the intermediolateral cell column uh, about as low as lumbar spinal cord level L1. That's lumbar spinal cord level, L1, not lumbar spine column level, L1, because as we said, the lumbar spinal cord, the spinal cord terminates at around the L1 level. So these sympathetic thoracolumbar outputs have their nerve cell bodies uh, in the lumbar, thoracolumbar spinal cord about as low as the level of L1 and they arise from the intermediolateral cell column. Well, as you recall, the anatomy of the uh, sympathetic nervous system, these sympathetic efferent motor neurons leave the spinal cord in the ventral root. From the ventral root, they pass out of the ventral root, then they uh, exit the ventral root through the white Rami communicantes, and from there, uh, they have one of several fates as they pass through the sympathetic ganglia that re reside uh, alongside of the spinal uh, column. Well, one of the fates of these uh, sympathetic efferent neurons is that they can 
either ascend or descend the sympathetic chain by uh, projecting either upward or downward uh, in the chain. And in the lumbar spine, uh, many of these efferent motor neurons descend down the sympathetic chain, which extends all the way down into the sacral region uh, of the spinal column. Now, when we say that the sympathetic chain extends down into uh, the sacral region, we're, we are indicating that it's the sympathetic chain. But all of those neurons traveling in the sympathetic chain have as their lowest uh, point of origin no lower than approximately the L1 level uh, of the spinal cord. And so this is the way that these uh, sympathetic motor uh, neurons are able to innervate the structures of the lower extremity, which is the topic of this program. So like the parasympathetics, the sympathetics would innervate the somatic structures uh, of the lower extremity, which would include uh, blood vessels, which would include the glands, and which would uh, include uh, the erector pili muscles. So again, uh, note that at the lumbosacral enlargement uh, of the conus medullaris, there's a lot of activity going on. The gray matter here increases tremendously to accommodate the number of neurons needed to innervate the lower extremity structures. Here uh, also at the lumbosacral enlargement, we have the least amount of uh, white matter because this is the part of the spine that has the least amount of ascending and descending uh, tracks. And the intermediolateral cell column is present only from uh, T1 to approximately L2, sometimes L3. And this is where the nerve cell bodies for autonomic uh, efferent neurons ri reside. Then there's a, a short period where there is no uh, lateral cell column. And then in the sacral spinal regions of S2, S3, and S4, we have uh, an analogous uh, region, an analogous intermediolateral cell column, which then uh, gives us with parasympathetic uh, preganglionic motor neurons. And then finally, before all these uh, nerve roots of the cauda equina can then go on to innervate structures of the lower extremity, uh, they dangle down the lumbar spinal column uh, unattached with the dorsal and ventral roots unattached. They eventually do attach and become conjoined in the same perineurium immediately prior to the exit of the nerve root uh, from the corresponding section of the spinal column. And remember that in the cervical spine, the nerve roots leave the spinal column above the named vertebra. For example, the C1 nerve root leaves the spine above the C1 vertebra. In the lumbar spine, the uh, nerve roots leave the spine below uh, the corresponding vertebra. So in the lumbar spine, the L4 nerve root uh, leaves the spinal column uh, below the L4 vertebra. And at that point, it is then a, a conjoined uh, spinal nerve root containing uh, all four types of uh, fibers, general somatic afferent and general somatic efferent, and then also general visceral efferent in general visceral afferent. And then once, uh, once it leaves the uh, neuroforamen, the nerve root then divides uh, into a dorsal primary ramus and a ventral primary ramus. And it's from the ventral primary rami that we get both the lumbar and sacral plexuses.